Welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I think, yeah, a few more coming in. Great. Um, it's a pleasure to see everyone. Um, it's been such a pleasure and honor to work with others on organizing this uh, day of celebration in honor of our beloved Lawrence Friedman. Um, we have a very packed panel with um, five commentators, uh, three uh, here and two uh, who needed to zoom in, and um, I will introduce them shortly. Um, but I did want to say just um, a brief word uh, myself um, about how truly special Lawrence is and how incredibly grateful um, I am for him, and we all are, uh, for his presence, his devotion, his intellect. Um, uh, we want you to feel as deeply respected and loved as you truly are, Lawrence. Um, so you've heard the perspective of uh, lots of people this morning. Um, uh, I'll just add briefly my own. Um, some of it will repeat, of course. We can say the obvious that we all know. Uh, Lawrence is truly, uh, uniquely prolific, uh, uh, really incredibly so. Uh, and he also has, as I thought um, Stuart Banner pointed out really very well this morning, uh, a distinctive presence and uh, voice. Uh, Lawrence's capacity to draw on a real depth of social and historical detail, but also at the same time to provide a kind of um, synoptic perspective uh, that brings it all together um, is, is really quite exceptional. And then his ability to do that in uh, prose that is always uh, incredibly, incredibly lucid uh, is even that much more um, exceptional. Um, I would add to these things, some of which we've already touched on, um, that Lawrence has really been absolutely fearless. Uh, fearless in championing his, his deepest held uh, commitments, including as he uh, described it uh, to all of us this morning, his uh, religious uh, devotion to uh, law and society. Uh, and it, it bears emphasis, I think, that he's um, remained uh, faithful to these commitments uh, throughout the years really without regard to what is uh, trendy at the moment uh, in uh, the academic literature, which um, in itself, I think, really sets him uh, apart. Um, and it bears um, emphasis, I think, as well, that his um, devotion and loyalty and fearlessness um, extel extend well beyond uh, academic principles uh, to the people in his life. So I, I know in academia we are supposed to uh, focus on the great intellect, and of course, uh, uh, that is there in spades, as we've been discussing, but I think it would be um, a mistake in this context not to mention as well um, that uh, there is tremendous menschlichkeit here, uh, <laughs> truly, um, as all of his uh, really countless uh, students over the years, his colleagues, as well as his beloved family members know, um, Lawrence is a true friend and supporter, steadfast, uh, doesn't blow with the winds, is always, always there, can always be counted on. Um, he's really been a rock and a foundation as well as an inspiration. Um, I personally am finding it devastating not to have him uh, across the office from me, and I keep begging him to use Lyft to come in to the office nearby. I've also offered to do some driving. Uh, maybe Leah or Sarah can persuade him to take me up on that. Um, and I'll just, I know I need to shut up. I do want to say, Leah, you deserve recognition here as well. You are true. I love you both dearly and respect you both, and we all do. Okay, I'll shut up now. Uh, and move on to uh, introducing our wonderful speakers. So I'm going to try to go in the order in which they are presenting. So we are going to um, begin with Sergio Puig. Um, Sergio is the Evo de Concini Professor of Law at the University of Arizona Law School and the director of its International Trade and Business Law Program. And I should note here, I'm going to have to give condensed biographies, given how much we have ahead of us. Uh, all of these speakers, there is much, much more that could be said to, to laud them. This is going to be a few short and sweet highlights. Um, and as I uh, said to him today, I just realized he is headed off to serve as the Joint Chair in International Economic Law 
at the European University Institute's law faculty, so many congratulations on that. He is a um, graduate of um, Stanford's Spills and JSD program, a point of great pride for us, and um, uh, not least Lawrence. Um, and he teaches and writes extensively on a range of issues in international trade and business law, including a very recent book with Cambridge entitled At the Margins of Globalization, Indigenous Peoples and International Economic Law. Um, our next speaker is um, Carolyn Ramsey. Um, she is a professor of law at Colorado Law School um, and an alum of Stanford Law School where um, she earned a JD uh, while also receiving uh, graduate training as a social uh, historian at the university. Uh, she teaches courses in criminal law, criminal procedure, domestic violence, gender issues, and legal history. She publishes widely on historical and modern aspects of criminal law, criminal procedure, and gender issues. And this includes a new book about the history of criminal justice responses to intimate partner violence that's forthcoming with Cambridge, uh, entitled Houses of Pain, Domestic Violence, and Legal Intervention in the U.S. 1870 to 1994. Uh, our uh, next speaker is um, Itai Ravid. Itai is an assistant professor at Villanova Law School and another um, proud, we're proud, I don't know if he's proud, hopefully, <laughs> uh, graduate of Stanford Spills and JSD programs. His main uh, research interests are uh, in criminal law and procedure. Uh, his empirically based scholarship focuses on the connections between criminal law, technology, race, and society with a particular attention to the accountability of the criminal justice system in an era of digital democracy. His work has been awarded uh, a bunch of prizes and has been published in such leading journals as the Southern California Law Review and UCI Irvine Law Review. Um, I'm not entirely sure um, whether Samantha or Rogelio are speaking next, but since they appear, I'll, I'll introduce them in the order in which they appear on our screen. Um, Samantha Barbas, um, who is unfortunately having to join us remotely, is a professor at Buffalo Law School and the director of the Baldy Center for Law and Social Policy. She earned her JD here at Stanford uh, while working on a, um, and finishing, uh, a PhD in US history uh, over uh, the Bay at Berkeley. Um, she researches and teaches in the area of legal history, First Amendment law, and mass communications law. She's published a, extensively, a, a whopping six books, so uh, uh, catching up with, with Lawrence. Um, her new book, Actual Malice, Civil Rights, and Freedom of the Press in New York Times v. Sullivan, is uh, soon to appear, I think, in a couple months, um, or maybe less than a month, uh, with University of California Press. Uh, and last but not least, um, Rogelio Perez Perdomo, uh, also joining us remotely, is a professor at the Universidad Metropolitana in Caracas, uh, where he previously served as dean. And he has been a regular visiting professor here at Stanford Law um, since 1998, and we are very grateful to keep having him. Uh, he is a foremost expert on issues of law and society, um, and he has taught and been recognized in universities around the globe. Uh, he's also the former president of the Research Committee on Sociology of Law of the International Sociological Association. He's published uh, way too many books and articles in uh, Spanish, English, and other languages for me to uh, note them all. I will just mention briefly that among his uh, many achievements, appropriate to note here, is a um, co-edited book uh, with our own Lawrence Friedman entitled Legal Cultures in the Age of Globalization, Latin America and Latin Europe. Uh, and so with that, we'll turn it over to Sergio. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. And thank you, Amalia and Bernie and everybody involved in putting this together. Just put it like this, yeah. And to Leah, obviously, and Amy and Sarah and David and all the family members for being here. It's really a pleasure and an honor um, to be here and to give these remarks. And I'm going to try to just uh, give you a brief introduction of the book. And I think, you know, for that, I will just remind people that if you look at my Facebook, uh, you will see that I'm also from Papua New Guinea. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. <laughs> um, I did a bit for different reasons that Manuel, my fellow Papuan, uh, being Mexican and suffer a couple of incidents with immigration <laughs> authorities that asked me about my immigration status, I decided to uh, adopt a new place of residence as a way to conceal my identity. 
I think this is a nice way to introduce the book, which is written, as Stuart said, with the prose of a wise man that tells you a great story. Lawrence is not only a great and loyal mentor for many of us, um, for, uh, but it's, he is the consummate storyteller. Thank you, Lawrence, and I hope you continue telling your stories, including to Future Spills Fellows and teaching fellows like Jonathan, Itai, Manuel, Moria, Diego, and, of course, myself. Uh, Lauren's new book, Personal Identity in the Modern World, and I won't say this is the latest book because I'm sure there is another since its publication back in 2022, uh, resolves one of the biggest remaining mysteries of our university. Our university, at the university. I think for that, Lawrence should finally get his long overdue Nobel Prize. The mystery that Lawrence resolves is in this fascinating book escape sharp detectives, including Sherlock Holmes, or even Lawrence M. Major. Frank Major. <laughs> Frank Major, who was unable to put the rest this question. And here I'm not referring to the mystery of who killed Maggie Swift. That, in fact, remains a somehow controversial issue <laughs> among a group of very niche readers. Instead, uh, the book addresses with persuasive diligence a more urgent question, at least in California, California. And the question is why you cannot get into the same river twice. The answer to this question might seem obvious, or at least to my few Californians who normally don't have to get into any river because of the drought not this week, obviously, but, uh, but like most of Lawrence's literary contributions, there are sharp insights and deep questions in his analysis. So what do I refer? As Lawrence makes clear in this and many of his wonderful books and articles, cultural change is often the result of social change that mold and influence our life, including our relationship with law, society, and more importantly, with authority. But social change, and in particular, the power of geographic and social mobility, can change the way people think about their identity. Or, as he puts it, to what extent we see each other as a Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde. I won't give you the answer, but in exploring this intensely relevant question as communities of internets rely on the anonymity of the internet or politics organizes around identities, some of them with a bit twisted of identities, Lauren explores how social change can impact individual ideas about the self. Lawrence does that by analyzing an amazing amount of evidence, including cases, legislation, novels, films, and many other reference to facts, including to distant places like Bhutan, to explore the transformation of society, mainly in the US, the UK, Canada, Australia. Anglo societies that he knows very well, since the Industrial Revolution. In the book, we learn how the Industrial Revolution unleashed a period of great social and spatial mobility that transformed the relationship with authority. The social compacts that the, uh, that, um, uh, and the concept of the self, leading to an era, a more current one, of individualism. In the world since the Industrial Revolution, identity became blurred, fluid, and changeable. The little village where people knew each other was left behind, leading to the big city and its life, a dangerous, deceiving, and murderous place that led to concerns about different types of crimes, like the crimes of mobility, like bigamy, and serial killers. But it was not all too bad. New literally genres emerged out of these concerns, including spies and detective novels that reflected on the ambiguity of identity. Who really is the, this person, the, the, Dr. Jenkins, Mr. Hyde, or we can ask Mr. Friedman or Mr. Meyer, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> the new societies pose a fundamental challenge. The vertical, hierarchical form of authority that nobility and elites use for social control since the foundation of the nation became less useful. Such all forms of authority demanded different compromises like the Victorian Pact that allowed for some misbehavior as long as it was done not publicly in display. As some sort of don't ask, don't tell of the time. The new society was a society of opportunities that required strong measures to restrain the social energy. A horizontal, less hierarchical form of authority emerged with absurd rules and ideals, including crazy ones like eugenics or the severe sanctioning of sexual behavior, especially of women, like Caroline Bill 
But the new form of authority that enabled new forms of identity, mostly for men, also led to the new paradigms. Identity as a matter of choice propelled a powerful idea, the idea of individual choice. Personal identity had become a matter of choice and social revolution overturned the Victorial Pact and its morality. The age of expressive individualism emerged and slowly formed the republic of choice. New religions, new identities, new flavors, new paradigms. I can give you my family as an example. Having moved from Iran and Mexico, my nuclear family celebrates Shabbat with pork carnitas and tacos. <laughs> my Persican children, the product of my wife Persican and my Mexican culture, add sour cream to their tacos. A grave offense, like Tino knows, among Mexican, fa uh, Mexican families. The book, excellent, inspiring book, leaves us with many lessons. For me, and I was happy to see this in the book, because he presented this in person, is a discussion of how the new age that arose as a product of new forms of identity, also impacted by new technologies and an age of globalization, affected the world. It provides deep insights to the understanding of international trade and its regulation, my field of writing, not as a product of greed of corporations seeking to make profit around the world. That exists too. That might be true. But a more hopeful reading is the way our modern society has been impacted by the changes in the concept of identity. This includes the demands for better products, better services, as well as more rights, including human rights. It has given us elements and ideas to confront the authoritarian tendencies that we see emerging today in many leaders, including in the US. While the meaning of identity will continue to change, and Lauren makes no predictions, because he's not fond of predictions, people will continue to rely on its uh, different notions of identity as a way to confront oppression and marginalization, or at least that I hope. Social change, like water, is fluid, and like water, once the process is ongoing, it's hard to stop, and that why, that's why Lawrence will say, you cannot get into the same river twice. <laughs> Maybe. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Good afternoon. I hope that you picked up by the microphone. I am very pleased to have been invited back to Stanford Law School, my alma mater, to celebrate a true giant in the fields of legal history, law and society, and criminal law. Personal identity in the modern world is a thought-provoking, entertaining, really fun um, read that uses examples and insights from as many as two centuries of legal history and social history um, to demonstrate the power of mobility, both geographic and social, to transform personal identity. Years ago, I became a fan of Lawrence's work when I read his classic monograph with Bob Percival, The Roots of Justice, which used primary sources and dusty archives to track the professionalization of the criminal legal system in Alameda County, California. Personal Identity and the Modern World is a very different book, but I'm equally a fan. Here Lawrence showcases another of his many talents, that of revealing the big picture. He synthesizes and expands on his own research and the work of many other scholars to help his reader, readers see multiple periods of American and British history vividly in a new light. The book charts the shift from the face-to-face -face communities of the early modern period to the relative anonymity of the urbanized 19th century. In this milieu, men could shed one identity, adopt another one. In the United States, by contrast to England, men could aspire to wealth in what was supposedly at least a classless society. Lawrence also discusses the 20th century in the book and concludes with the insight that globalization and technology in our own time have created a new kind of village um, that s sacrifices privacy <coughs> for this kind of vague concept of connectedness. Users of apps like Instagram seek a certain evanescence by posting photos with the assumption that this digital record will disappear. But whether you're a crime victim, a perpetrator, or just someone who's trying to change their stripes, technology makes it hard to escape one's past. Detectives scour Google searches and social media posts that criminal suspects have made, and they use DNA and genealogical resources to crack cold cases. 
I especially like the way Lawrence's new book integrates history and literature to demonstrate how the latter reflected and reinforced social change. For example, he describes all these different subgenres of crime fiction, the murder mystery, the hard-boiled detective novel, the police procedural story, which grew in popularity as the criminal justice system itself developed. These fictional works often turned on mistaken identities, and they appeal, appeal to a duality of middle-class fear of and fascination with crime. In an age when mobility was making new types of offenses possible and making old crimes like murder and theft harder to solve. Now I'm gonna focus the balance of my talk on a topic that plays more of a secondary or shadow role in Lawrence's book. The way geographic and social mobility and shifting identities affected women and families who were, as Lawrence notes, less able than men to transform themselves into something new for many of the years that his book covers. I'll also discuss the way the image of true womanhood was often deployed in a conservative way in an effort to preserve Victorian social norms against the flow of change, against that river that Sergio was talking about, and the anxiety though it was created as women sought to claim more rights and choices. Lawrence notes at several points in his new book that women's identities were sharply restricted, even as men experienced geographic and social mobility. He writes, mobility had a deep impact on women, but in ways that were secondary and more subtle compared to the mobility of men. One of the key concepts in the 19th century United States was that of the self-made man, the Abraham Lincoln, who rose from the log cabin to the White House. There were fewer self-made women. In fact, there was no such term. Now to be sure, women could increase their wealth and their social power. In literature, they were sometimes given these opportunities by men. Lawrence refers to Bernard Shaw's Eliza Doolittle, the flower girl whom Professor Higgins teaches to be an aristocratic lady simply by correcting the way she pronounces certain words. In real life, of course, women also transformed themselves of their own initiative by making advantageous marriages or by even starting businesses, respectable or not. Especially in the West, they taught school, or less respectably, they ran taverns and brothels. Educated women eventually began to enter fields such as journalism, social work, law, as restrictions on the types of jobs that they could hold were lifted. But women's ability to make a living was still very much constrained compared to men's. And middle class wives, especially those with young kids, um, were discouraged from pursuing careers. 19th century women. Women went west with the wagon trains, first of all, and later with the transcontinental railroad. So in this sense, they were geographically mobile. Um, but as Lawrence notes, many more men sought their fortunes alone in California, sometimes entering into bigamous marriages or uh, pretending to be married to new mistresses that they uh, picked up along the way. The gender imbalance in the west contributed to interpersonal violence as men competed for a smaller population of female settlers. Because I study domestic violence, I'm sensitive to the fact that in this age of mobility, women still face daunting hurdles to exit from violent intimate relationships. Constrained from leaving by the stigma of divorce, the relatively few employment opportunities for women, the burden of childcare, fear of the perpetrators of violence and more, they found themselves trapped with abusive husbands. Divorce, of course, became more accessible decades uh, before California enacted its first no-fault statute in 1970, and Lawrence has admirably contributed his um, expertise in this area by really inventing the concept, uh, a legal and social and historical concept of creeping no-fault. Of course, he didn't invent it on the ground, but he discovered it um, in the archive. Um, but escaping a batter, even as divorce became more accessible, was never simple, never easy. As Lawrence describes in the book, women were also victimized by crimes of mobility, whether a bigamist was a swindler, a dissatisfied husband, or an honest man who really believed that his marriage had come to a legal end, the subsequent wife was ruined to find that she was inadvertently living in sin. These subsequent wives were usually the ones, Lawrence says, to bring the bigamy prosecutions. Now women occasionally got husbands or sought husbands um, using false pretenses too. My own research into the legal history of domestic violence turned up a case in San Francisco 
of a wife who replied to a newspaper advertisement seeking a spouse that had been posted by a lonely man in Oregon. When she fatally shot her existing husband, she claimed to have done so self-defensively because he threatened to kill her in a drunken rage. But neither this narrative nor her insanity plea raised much sympathy with the judge or jury, even though such defenses often were successful in women's cases. She was convicted of manslaughter. Despite the comparatively freewheeling sexual culture of the 1920s when this case occurred, the defendant was unable to present herself as a good wife, for obvious reasons, um, or a virtuous woman according to prevalent moral standards. Now, in more typical cases of bigamy and homicide, the bigamist was an abusive man who was convicted of murdering at least one of his wives um, when his dirty secret was discovered. Lawrence's book highlights other ways in which women were actually or rhetorically cast as victims of mobility. The moral panic over white slavery during the progressive era constitutes one example. The Mann Act of 1910 criminalized the transportation of women across state lines for immoral purposes, and it codified a waning, uh, an anxiety over the waning Victorian repression of sexuality. But it wasn't just a matter of patriarchy trying to exert control over teenage girls. For example, after California women got the vote at the state level in 1911, female reformers too dedicated themselves to trying to stamp out prostitution and to saving their younger, poorer sisters from delinquency, a campaign that often showed signs of class bias and anti-immigrant prejudice. Indeed, various images of womanhood, from pure virgins and moral mothers to pitiful beaten wives and fallen prostitutes, were deployed in an effort to restore the status quo ante and to bolster Victorian norms of duty, self-restraint, industry, and sobriety. Lawrence points out that even the fictional amateur detective, Miss Marple, whom Agatha Christie invented in the 1920s, played a role in temporarily rebuilding the social order every time she solved a complex murder mystery. Jane Marple remained unmarried, which gave her more freedom than wives and mothers had. According to Victorian values, women needed to be controlled, but also protected. And those who failed to protect them received social and legal condemnation. Of course, as Lawrence notes, there was no social safety net during this time of great mobility. Urbanization and the geographic flow of people, particularly towards the West and the United States, undermined neighborly assistance. Lawrence writes that the legal system was not much of a source of relief either, and that no concept of a social duty, a state duty, a collective duty, to provide for individual welfare except in the most minimal sense existed. As I argue in my forthcoming book on domestic violence, which I hope will be coming out later this year after Lawrence publishes another half dozen <laughs> of books of his own, um, as I argue in my forthcoming book, um, this lack of a social safety net was one of the biggest flaws in the way the legal system approached wife abuse um, in the 19th and, and 20th centuries. Police prosecutors and judges and juries actually sought to punish wife beater, beaters during this time, um, but without a social safety net, women had little chance of exit, and so they remained reluctant to prosecute their husbands. Lawrence uses many examples to show that mobility meant people could have secret doubles, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The potential to craft new identities raised the disconcerting prospect that men were not who they seemed, and that beneath the veneer presented to the outside world, deviance and criminality might lurk. Interestingly, it seems that society was less willing to admit that women might have evil twins, notwithstanding the, the uh, woman who was seeking a second husband and the, the example I quoted, um, oftentimes juries and judges really rejected this concept of um, the evil woman defendant. The possibility that there was such a, a woman out there inspired sensational cases. Um, prosecutors tried Lizzie Boren for kissing her, killing her parents, for example. But in the end, onlookers and jurors refused, refused to believe that a respectable girl like Lizzie Borden could secretly be a murderess. In other cases, though, including many that I found in my own research, juries and other personnel in the criminal legal system exonerated female defendants on the grounds that they had killed justifiably. There was a different kind of binary at work here. Either the abusive man whom the woman killed had lurked behind a respectable image, and newspaper readers both loved and reviled uh, the sensation of a doctor, lawyer, or politician being caught beating his wife, 
or he represented the threatening half of what Lawrence calls the dual personality of society. Many wife beaters were described as idle, unemployed drunks, often immigrants or restless poor men who moved their families from place to place, sort of the seedy side um, of this geographical mobility, the underbelly of the American dream. The intriguing idea of doubles pervades Lawrence's new book, Secret Identities, Evil Twins, This Duality of Respectable and Unrespectable America. I'd just like to add that the image of true womanhood could be a double-edged sword too. I previously mentioned how images of women, angels of the house, or victims of unscrupulous men were wielded to censor, censure transgressors and to bolster the Victorian social order. But Victorian womanhood did not only serve traditional domesticity. The suffrage movement also claimed the image of the moral mother. In alliance with temperance, first wave feminists argued that women could use newly granted political power to outlaw liquor and bring men home from the taverns. That was actually one of the biggest selling points of women's suffrage to non-feminists um, who favored prohibition. In the parts of Lawrence's book devoted to late 20th century examples, he traces the rise of identity politics, that is rights based on groups rather than individuals. The civil rights, feminist, and LGBTQ movements all asserted new forms of identity. The position of women, of course, for the greater part of the two centuries covered in his book reflected their traditional subordination. Once they became part of the change, they also became more threatening. My own research indicates that women's equality claims led them to be seen more often as aggressors in criminal cases, including in domestic violence cases. Anxiety about changing gender roles manifested itself in a variety of ways. In a fascinating part of Lawrence's book devoted to the McMartin preschool case, for example, he uses a 1980s witch hunt involving the alleged sexual abuse of young children um, to connect a headline-grabbing trial with the anxiety and guilt that career women were supposed to feel about entrusting their young children to daycare. And voila, moral panic. <laughs> when I began writing this talk, I thought I could briefly discuss a secondary aspect of personal identity in the modern world. We were only given about 12 minutes, and I thought, look, women don't appear that often in the index, so um, this ought to be something I could cover quickly. Um, but like everything else on Lawrence's sweeping canvas, the story of how an increasingly fluid, urbanized, anonymous world affected women, marriage, and family turns out to be a rich and complex topic that you can't do justice to in this short amount of time. It's easy to go on too long and praising such an engaging book, even when you're talking about a relatively limited part of it. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amalia. Bernie, I don't know if she's here, but for organizing this. <clears throat> I'm really glad to be here, to be back after uh, two and a half years. I'm really delighted to share some thoughts about uh, Lawrence's book. So in a way, when I finished reading the book, I thought to myself, this book has an issue of its own self-identity, right? So what is this book about? Um, so it's a, you know it's a beautiful, captivating uh, language. It's sparkled with fascinating anecdotes, discussions of legal cases, classics, pop culture references, and in this way, Lawrence is able to convince his readers that they are reading a story written by an engaging storyteller. But in fact, what they read is um, a very complex, deep insights written by a profound academic thinker. They might not even know what they're exposed to, but that's part of the, I think, the beauty of Lawrence's writing. Just the ability to convey those complex messages and, and complicated uh, narratives into uh, such a, a beautiful uh, uh, writing. Now, to be honest, uh, there is a question then, what's the real identity of the book? But as I will soon argue, from the perspective of the book, it actually might not really matter. It's simply a beautiful book. So uh, Sergio summarized it wonderfully, so I will not add much. But chief among those core arguments uh, is the idea that mobility in the modern world has shifted or complicated our conceptions of personal uh, identity. I love seeing how different themes from uh, Lawrence's uh, scholarship uh, appear and pop up so organically in this book. Issues of the importance of the camera, for example, which I've he's written about before, issues of, glo of globalization, the dissatisfaction from American food, that's also part of his book as well. 
Um, all this emphasizes this rich and overarching conversation is able to convey in the most natural, compelling storytelling style. Now, the book ur urged me to think about the fluidity of self-identity and how the transition to urban from rural life have offered opportunities to redefine self-identities. At the same time, I could not avoid thinking about the challenging task of drawing social patterns in such complex reality. And of course, about counterexample. For example, and forgive me that my universe of illustration is a bit limited. As a father of three children, I had a Disney character in mind when reading the book. And I was thinking about Mulan. Um, um, Mulan, the young woman living in a small Chinese village in an ultra patriarchal community that sets particular expectation that she simply can't meet. And she can't really avoid them, but even though she represents those pre, uh, uh, those, those eras that Lawrence describes as the pre-Victorian eras, she was able, despite those kind of uh, familiarity in the village, to recreate herself, to redefine her own identity, coming up as a man fighting, fighting in the war. At the same time, if the concerns raised by Lawrence relate in part to modern society, uh, becoming a society of strangers, I could not, not think about a uh, very kind of popular trend of uh, TV shows about the small towns TV shows, uh, Twin Peaks, Broadchurch, all those supposed to represent towns in which these are societies that, that are presumably not societies of strangers, but in fact criminality, uh, um, uh, death, uh, rape happens within those society uh, in the same manner. So. There is a tension here, I believe, um, around the realization that the small community where everyone is supposed to know each other are also, in fact, societies of stranger, despite them not being societies of stranger. So the ability to hide identity might not only be a product of geography, but it includes a combination of unique traits, personal traits that can all equally emerge in the city, in the town, and in the village. There are two points I would like to discuss that I think uh, might be the next stage of the conversation around uh, Lawrence's thesis. First, I would like to raise the question of why we think the transition described in Lawrence's book is problematic, if it is problematic. That is, if we were to choose how to form our own self-identities, should we prefer the pre-Victorian villager self-identity, or rather the current complex and elusive concept of self-identity that Lawrence uh, identifies in his book? Lawrence does not necessarily choose or have an answer, but to a certain extent, he suggests there is one. For example, one clear argument he raises is that the new possibilities to alter self-identities have increased lack of public safety by introducing new crimes like bigamy, blackmail, confidence games, and, and the like. As such, one can draw a conclusion that the limitation on abilities to hide identities might reduce crime in society, build social trust, and maybe increase social cohesiveness. I I'm not sure, but maybe. On the other hand, the lack of limitations uh, is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because with the main support that we have from this new transition uh, relates to the elements of choice and status that are uh, well intertwined. I don't have an answer to this question, but there is, seems to be a trade-off between these two concepts. The ability to choose might lead some people to choose poorly and increase crime, but on the other hand, allows more people to strive to define themselves in any way they want. And the more, that most clo closely resembles who they consider themselves to be their true selves, if such a term even exists. In any event, what is clear to me is that if anything, modern days exacerbate the ability to establish self-identities that go beyond what Lawrence defines as the subjective and the objective identity. For example, people on social media can create multiple identities at the same time. They can be straight men on social media platform one, gay uh, women on social media platform two, and a Star Wars nerd fan teenager on a social media platform three. In a sense, all these identities comprise that person's identity, but at the same time, they simply don't. From the perspective of trust and social cohesiveness, such abilities negatively affect our social fabric, but our individualism and freedom allegedly increase. But what is the meaning of such freedom in a virtual space at all? I mean, do we even care about it? And that relates to the second point I would like to raise. 
What is the relationship between subjective and objective self-identity? And more importantly, whether in a world of performance, heuristics, and lack of solidarity, does subjective self-identity even matter? In his book, Lawrence discusses the distinctions between the two, with the objective being your self-identity and the subject uh, being the, how society perceives you, and the subjective being how one perceives uh, herself. But this made me wonder about the practical meaning of this distinction. What I had in mind thinking about, given my uh, scholarly interest, is uh, think criminal law. So indeed, as, as many of you know, over the years, substantive criminal law has moved from the mere recognition of the act, or the actus reus, as to the core source of, crimin source of criminal culpability, to a recognition in the importance of individualizing the personhood, understanding the criminal mind that led one to do the act they did. With this transition in the US, you can see this in the Model Penal Court, for example, uh, there is a rec stronger recognition of individualism. So we are willing to subjectivize because you are who you are. We're willing to give some space to that person, willing to consider the subjective self, how you perceive things as they happen based on what you are and how you experience them. This vision seems to suggest that subjective self-identity and the freedom to choose and define yourself might have indeed a meaningful effect in the real world, even on your physical freedom. However, in the reality we know, objective self-identity is likely much more meaningful. If society, your neighbor or your local police officer believe you are guilty of crime because you belong to a certain group, say a group that is racially profiled or a group that is exposed to routine negative expressions, you will probably be guilty even if you don't consider yourself one. In those scenarios, even if you perceive yourself a different individual, a pacifist that do not believe in violence, you might have a hard time convincing the external forces that this is your true self, your true identity. For them, your true identity is predefined by social structures and stereotypical thinking, and based on such objective identity decisions are formed. In these situations, your freedom to perceive yourself as a different person makes little difference. Thank you. Samantha, are you able to reveal yourself? <laughs> yeah, she's here. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to comment on this wonderful book, Personal Identity and the Modern World. This book offers a compelling and really entertaining look at the way that concepts of personal identity revolutionized in the 19th century and beyond in response to unprecedented social and geographic mobility. So as Lawrence explains, um, industrialization, the railroad, and the rise of cities led to this revolution in personal identity as people were able to move to places other than where they were born and to reinvent themselves. Before, in small villages and towns where someone's family had lived for generations, a person's past was well known and identities were fixed. In contrast, in the cities, in these vast faceless environments populated by strangers, people could adopt new personas for good or for ill. A person could change their name and adopt a new identity by slipping into the crowd. People could selectively disclose their pasts or even conceal them altogether. This fluidity had consequences for individuals and also for society at large. As the book describes so compellingly, new kinds of crimes took off. The crimes of mobility, like bigamy, the confidence game, blackmail, and the crimes of men with strange dual personas like Jack the Ripper and Dr. Jekyll. At the same time, there is a new fascination in the culture with personal identity that shows up in new kinds of literature, such as mysteries, spy novels, detective novels, genres that explored the possibilities, in some cases, the dark possibilities that existed in an uncertain world where a person could adopt new guises and easily pretend to be someone they were not. Most people, as the book points out, were not 
criminals or confidence men. Yet ordinary people, solid citizens, were also partaking in the opportunities offered by this new mobility. Citizens from all walks of life tried to ascend the social ladder to improve their fates by taking on new appearances, accents, mannerisms, or even in some cases, new racial or religious identities. Personal identity was becoming increasingly changeable and in some respects, a matter of personal choice. And it is this theme that I have been interested in in some of my own work, how ordinary citizens in the period since the period that the book focuses on, namely in the 20th and 21st centuries have attempted to transform their identities and how they have understood that work and those transformations. So in the 20th century, I think a new kind of American dream developed. And in this new American dream, it was not actual labor, not hard work in the traditional sense that took someone from rags to riches, that built personal success and fulfillment. Rather, it was through identity work, identity creation and transformation that people often made success and even fortunes in their lives. My writing in this area <clears throat> has been on the right to privacy. And that is a story that Lawrence touches on in his book. The story of the right to privacy begins in the late 1800s with the famous Warren and Brandeis article, The Right to Privacy, and the invention of the invasion of privacy tort. The right to privacy was bound up with these issues of personal identity. The right to privacy was conceptualized in American law and culture as the right to control your public image and identity. So under the right to privacy, you can sue someone if they present you to the public in a way that contradicts how you want to be known to the public. That's one example of an invasion of privacy. The growth of privacy law in the late 19th and 20th century reflected the increasing priority that American culture placed on images, public images, for the reasons that Lawrence describes in the book. Public image becomes very important. In a world of strangers, your identity and your fate depend on the impressions that you make. Impression management, to use sociologist Irving Goffman's phrase, became an important personal project and goal. As sociologist David Reisman wrote famously, the modern American became an other directed individual whose life was organized by keeping attuned to the impressions of his peers. Yet at the same time, I think Americans were becoming not only other directed, but also inner directed. And this also shapes the way that people viewed their identities and the work that they did around them. Americans in the 20th century began to get two competing cultural messages about their public images and personas, messages that we still see today. One is the American dream message, that we can transform our lives and our fates through changing our images. This is the personal makeover story, the celebrity story, a story that is repeated insistently in advertising, popular culture, and self-help books. With the right clothing, the right words, the right gestures, we can make good impressions and transcend our social status. How to Win Friends and Influence People became a bestseller in the 1920s and heralded a new genre of popular literature. In celebrity magazines, Americans began to read stories like that of Rudolph Valentino, an unemployed waiter who made himself over and became the biggest star in America. One can't help but notice how there is a ring of inauthenticity in all of this. Certainly, this does seem like the con artist, right? the confidence man who puts one over on the world. 
almost as soon as this celebrity narrative began to rise, there were concerns that this sort of reinvention was really a form of deception. How can people, particularly advertisers for consumer products, convince Americans that in radically remaking their images, they were not being fraudulent? So there comes to be in the cultural dialogue around personal identity, another parallel storyline about authenticity. Advertisers, self-help gurus, journalists, and others insist that the purpose of cultivating and perfecting a public image or persona is not to deceive others, but rather to express one's authentic inner self. And we see this quite insistently today as self-expression and personal authenticity are prized ideals. In advertising, we're told how certain clothing or cosmetics or cars can help us express to the world who we really are, our inner selves. So we get the merger of consumerism, show business, and pop psychology. Actors starting in the 1920s became celebrated as icons and exemplars of this new mode of self-presentation. Audiences were fascinated with the way that actors constantly manipulated their images, how they took on a persona for one role, then completely remade themselves for the next role. But this wasn't deception, or so the Hollywood publicity departments preached. The celebrity merely expressed herself in every role and performance. She could not overtly dissimulate or fabricate as the movie camera with its searching gaze would expose all inauthenticity. So to be a movie star was not to act, was not to put on masks or false fronts, but rather to perform oneself, albeit in many different guises. So what you get by the middle of the 20th century, and this is perhaps the next chapter in the story that Lawrence tells in the book, is the notion that we are our images. Unless we are seeking to commit a crime, public image is not a mask that we put on to conceal ourselves. Rather, we're told that our images should reflect ourselves. It should be extensions of ourselves. If you wanna change yourself, change your image. In becoming blonde or driving an up-to-date car, you will change and become a better person. You'll become the best version of yourself or perhaps even discover your real self. These contradictions of public and private, authenticity and inauthenticity, inner life and the outer world are held together in this particular vision of identity and image that has been developed and promoted in significant part through a modern consumer, media, and celebrity industries. The self and the image have merged. We construct our very selves through the images and identities we make. And for that reason, personal images are more important to us than ever, as evidenced by the multi-billion dollar image industries, advertising, cosmetics, fashion, and even the new industry of personal image consulting. More than ever, we believe that we have a right, regardless of our status, to attempt to maximize our life possibilities by making choices about who we are and how we appear to others. The internet, of course, has taken all of this to a new level. We're told to use social media to reveal our lives, our opinions, our candid feelings to the world, and many of us do exactly that. Of course, people taking advantage of the anonymity of the internet also strategically manipulate their online personas, often to great advantage. Some Twitter or Instagram personalities are highly influential, more so than public leaders, and have millions of followers. The most celebrated internet personalities, I think, are not those who are perceived as being openly deceptive, 
but those who purportedly reveal their real selves online. However much we know that the internet is not real, we expect authenticity from its participants and performers. So in some ways, the internet offers a terrain of self-invention that is not unlike the 19th century city. What has changed between then and now is not just technology, but how we understand the nature and significance of our work of identity making and public performance. So in sum, personal identity has certainly taken interesting paths and trajectories from the historical roots that are illuminated in this work. With this book in hand, we can understand one of the most intriguing phenomena of modern times, how we conceptualize and create our social identities in a world where the possibilities for invention and reinvention are increasingly expansive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Rogelio, are you? Do you do you hear us? Are you? Oh, oh not supposed to be. Oh, so no, I have. Oh, okay. Go ahead. We're 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 listening, Rogelio. Ah, okay. Uh, but we would love to see your face if we could. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Amalia, for for organizing this uh, uh, homage to 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 Lauren Friedman. Um, I have a very special relation with Lawrence. I can say that Lawrence has been uh, uh, mi maestro and mi amigo. Uh, I think he's, uh, I have read many of his books, but particularly I had the privilege of teaching a seminar with Lawrence. And I always wonder who are learning more, if the students or, or myself uh, from, from Lawrence. And uh, also, I am very grateful to, uh, that, that you have asked me to comment on this book on, on uh, identity, on personal identity in the modern world. I think it's a really wonderful uh, 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 book. I have uh, uh, the privilege to read the, the kind of a, a, the, the early version. I'm very proud that the, the Spanish, uh, the Peruvian uh, publisher published uh, it before the, 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 the publisher in, in English. No? Uh, I think most of the, the people who have preceded me have said practically everything. I will try to answer one of the uh, questions that uh, Itai has put about the identity of, of this of this book. Uh, this is, uh, uh, my proposal is to consider this book an essay. It's a wonderful book. Uh, everybody has recognized it, uh, but it's difficult to pinpoint. No? Uh, uh, I, I will cite uh, uh, Pera Reverte that says that he's a uh, acclaimed novel uh, the Queen of the South is a Mexican corrido, a song, but he has uh, 500 wonderful pages. No? Uh, and I think this is to uh, the case of this uh, um, uh, essay. Uh, it has all the qualities of an essay. It's a, it's a very, uh, with a central and very clearly um, uh, idea. And a style that make uh, the reading easy and, and agreeable. I I think uh, of course the book has 150 pages of uh, long of, of the text, plus 20 pages of small letters of, of notes and a long bibliography as a masterpiece of a scholarship. Uh, in other words, uh, it's a very scholarly book, 
but Friedman has the virtue of uh, expressing the ideas in a very clearly and, and, and present a lot of information in a way that makes the reading fluid and, and very enjoyable. Uh, he demonstrates that the, 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 the scholarly writing not, uh, need not to be um, heavy and, and boring. On the content of the book, uh, already I think uh, I, I think the, my, my colleagues have said uh, practically everything that uh, could be, the, be said. The analysis of the of 19th century of this transformation of, of that implies 19th century and early 20th century is, is wonderfully, wonderfully put. Uh, and I will say that the book is much shorter on, on the analysis of our present time. It's only the last chapter that uh, Freeman called the brave new world. No? This is the, uh, it's the time of modernity, but of a uh, uh, a fluid modernity, which is uh, kind of more problematic than, than in the past. The mobility is still uh, uh, bigger. Uh, one example is this meeting. I am participating in the meeting in California while being in Caracas. No? Uh, but at the same time, uh, this is the, the point, the means of, of discovering our biological identity and, and to discover our past are much improved, which in fact uh, put the, the problem of, 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 uh, of personal identity. And I will think uh, also the issue of uh, authenticity and images that, uh, that Samantha has put uh, on. And I think uh, what... Uh, the, the book for, for me uh, shows that the identity is, is a big, big problem. No? And it's very much related with these issues of images and particularly of social roles. No? We don't know really who was uh, 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 Dr. Jekyll, uh, but we, we knew our, one of the roles of, of Dr. Jekyll we didn't uh, no, the, 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 the other ones. No? And that is the capacity of this, uh, in this society, of adopting these different images and, 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 and roles, but also the limits of doing that. No? And I think uh, a recent case, uh, the case of George Santos, uh, show this, these limits of, uh, in, uh, of these uh, uh, changes of identities. No? But the, the, the relation between uh, images and, 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 uh, and roles and, and the, the person, the, the, uh, the identity, is, I think, very complex. And I would like to, as I finish my very short reflection, with another uh, reference to, to, to uh, a literary reference. No? That a book that has impressed uh, very much uh, to me is uh, uh, the uh, the book by Camus, uh, The Fall, uh, which uh, a, a very successful lawyer, actually, uh, uh, Jean Baptiste Clemens, that was a successful lawyer and also a very good speaker and a reasonable tennis player and, and an accomplished seducer, uh, perceived that all of these things are roles and he decided to renounce to all his roles. So, and he become, uh, in his language, a Jewish penitent, uh, which is difficult to translate. But uh, the, the big issue is that who are we if we renounce to our images, to our social roles? So? And the answer of this book is, is terrible. Uh, uh, the the uh, Camus personage, uh, explain that in a wonderful monologue, monologue but uh, in fact, when we renounce to, to all our social roles is very little of what is left. Okay, uh, and I stop here. I think we have already have a, a long session and I'm very happy to have been part of this uh, meeting honoring uh, uh, Lauren Friedman and this wonderful book. I'll be 
I'll try to be extremely brief. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate the panelists. Um, I think they did a wonderful job. Maybe I shouldn't even say this because, you know, they were, many, they said many nice things about me, but I want to say I really learned a lot from the <laughs> panelists and I wish I had 20 more years to write books <laughs> suggested by some of the things they said. It was really very interesting. I want to say a word to about the history of this book because Rogelio <clears throat> made a mention that might have seemed a little strange. Um, so this book, um, since it's been published, and I'm very grateful to the publisher, um, Roman and Littlefield, they're a wonderful publisher. But the original version of this book was turned down by press after press. Okay, I'm not ashamed to admit it because it was eventually published. And Rogelio read it and he said, I really like this and I can get you a publisher in Spanish. So they translated it into Spanish and it appeared in Peru and must have sold at least five copies. <laughs> uh, I have one copy, Rogelio has one. Anyway, but I didn't give, you know, this, this was an encouragement, so I continued. I rewrote the book. I expanded it considerably. I mean, the core is there in Spanish. Any of you who read Spanish, I don't know how you'd get hold of it, but... Um, and I must say, I can't say that I read it in Spanish either, but um, then I tried to market it, and then, of course, it was turned down by another group of publishers, and finally, when I was about to give up, Roman and Littlefield agreed to publish it. And um, it's an interesting question to me. Uh, you know, everybody seemed to think it's a good book, and I don't want to, I'm certainly not going to contradict them, but <clears throat> many, many publishers didn't think so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's in the background of this book. But I think it's getting, you know, I'm, I've been around a long time. I, I think, I feel sorry for young people who are just done their great, PhD dissertation on Byzantine pottery of the 12th century <laughs> about how they're going to get that thing published so they can get a job. It's getting harder and harder. And the publisher, well, you don't want to hear, all of us who are authors, we can complain endlessly about <laughs> publishers. Um, I want to say one other thing. I want to talk about how I got interested in this. There are many channels. One is, of course, my interest in mystery stories, um, and particularly in the history of mysteries. And the question I asked was, why did this genre suddenly appear in the 19th century? I mean, there isn't any. Yes, you know, someone says, well, there was this Chinese tale from the third century BC. But the genre appeared suddenly with Edgar Allan Poe and then took off through the 19th century and continues t to this day. <clears throat> and so that was one question I kept asking myself. And many, many years ago, when I was, um, I had a trip to England and I worked in the public records office looking at old newspapers and I was struck with bigamy. Finally, you know, articles about bigamy and I thought, what is this? I mean, and I asked myself, how do you become a bigamist? I mean, I know how you become a bigamist. <laughs> I'm not recommending it. But the, you know, if you, you think this, you know, hypothetical tiny village bigamy is impossible because everybody knows everybody. And so Joe says to Mary, let's get married. She says, you're already married. You're married to Susie. So I th so, and then this led me to write an article called Crimes of Mobility. You know, also the confidence game, the, the expression, the very word, the concept, 
again, dates from the same period in the early 19th century, first half of the 19th century. And I thought, what is this about? And again, what is the confidence game? Well, there are thousands of versions. It's a big literature. But, you know, a, a man dresses up as a Catholic priest, and he goes around and he's collecting money. Of course, he's just, he's a con man. He's collecting for himself. Again, in the small village, if he, he says, I'm father so-and-so, they say, no, you're not. <laughs> so so all these things, I kept putting these things together. And that's, that's out of that came this book. That I, so that the conditions of society altered in such a way as to make it possible for people to project a different image or to, for their image to be ambiguous and for the outsiders not to know who are you. And, you know, the Jekyll and Hyde story is, runs through the whole book as a kind of, kind of metaphor. Another one is Jack the Ripper. This was a crime that was never solved. Um, murder of <clears throat> prostitutes in the east side of London. And it was interesting that there was suspicion fell on a prince, one of Queen Victoria's sons. Now, he happened to be completely innocent of that crime anyway, but <laughs> he wasn't even in town during this period. But the notion that this, there is somebody, there is somebody who is pretending to be, I mean, obviously, well, it could be a middle class person, a doctor, a, a member of the aristocracy, who at night turns into Jack the Ripper. But that was another kind of piece that fit into this. And then the whole idea of the big criminal trial. Who is Lizzie Borden? Is she this church-going, 30-year-old virgin? Or is she this vicious creature who you know, killed her father and mother with an axe, father and stepmother with an axe? So that's where this book came from, out of all of that speculation. And, I, and other things I threw in, the picture of Dorian Gray, which has the same general theme when you think about it as the theme that's in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mean, so, you know, I just tried to put these things together. Now, I must say that when we get to modern times, you know, I start petering out. And I was very interested in the, particularly in the things Samantha had to say and the whole notion of authenticity and what does the internet do and so forth. But that's for another life. <laughs> Uh, and at any rate, well, that's, that's it. I thought you did wonderful. Thank you, panelists. And maybe, do we have time for any questions? Or are you all just so bored and tired? <laughs> so, yeah, we'll have questions from the audience, and people online can, a reminder, you can put questions in the Q&A feature. Um, okay, I see Diego and then um, Bob. Bob, first of all. Diego and then Bob, yeah. Oh, we're waiting for the yeah, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so I, I thank you for, for the panel and all the intervention. It was a really rich discussion. Um, so actually, um, the question that I was thinking about was on, exa on the exact last point that, uh, that uh, Lawrence said about the next life. But I was, I was thinking whether all what we are uh, we have been talking about social media and the internet revolution. How could how could we treat that moment? Is part of this of a gradual change in social norms and practices, or should we treat it as a really like revolutionary moment in the way we think and understand all the issues that we have been talking about today: privacy, personal identity, etc. I can imagine someone better position to respond to that question than Lawrence, actually. You know, actually, I can't think of many people who are in a worse position to answer <laughs> the question. And, and the reason is because I'm an old guy. And, you know, I don't, you know, people talk about TikTok and tick chat or whatever. I have no idea what they're talking about any more than, the, you know, well, 
a lot of other things. In other words, I don't think, well, it's not just me. I don't think we're, we're yet in the position, you know, there's a famous story about Joe and Lai um, that he was asked, uh, you know, who he was. He was, you can't ever assume people do know, but okay, you know. He was number two to Mao Zedong in China. And the story, I don't know if it's true, but it's a wonderful story, is that he was asked uh, something about the influence of the French Revolution, and he said, it's too early to tell. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, some, there was a very profound answer. I, mean, I think in some ways, of course, it's not too early to tell, but I think it's, it's, things are really changed. How many people here can imagine what life was like before the cell phone. I mean, these things have transformed our life in so many ways. Think about television. I think the influence of television, and I'm old enough to remember the era before television. We had no television when I was growing up. Um, you know, we didn't have cell phones and that we didn't have air conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the te television has been transformative in so many ways. I think we still are not aware. So that's why, you know, one of the reasons why I like legal history is that it's something comfortable in dealing with the dead. You know, <laughs> you know they don't... I'm often, you know, I'm in great admiration when you, I read a book about the biography of, you know, someone recent like, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan and so on. How can they do that? There are just so many people to talk to, so many records and so on. And, <clears throat> you know, if you study the Elamite language, for instance, which you've never heard of, <laughs> but probably the whole corpus of Elamite literature can be put in like three pages. I think how lucky that scholar is. <laughs> right? And you know, when historians say, unfortunately, these records are lost, they mean fortunately these <laughs> records are lost because they don't have to look at them. Well, that's... That's neither here nor there. The point is, I think we just don't know yet. It's clear that everything is changing. Well, it's probably always been true that everything is changing, but the rate of change and the manner of change is different. And also, we're, uh, unlike, you know, Joe and Lai, I think we can see a lot of consequences from the French Revolution. But the consequences of the sexual revolution are harder to see. And of the, you know, internet revolution, you know, I leave it to young people like you, Diego, to figure it out. Okay? So, so that's my non-answer. You see, you get the pattern of how I've learned how not to answer the hard question. Bob Percival. Yeah. Let me just say quickly, read one, just a comment from online quickly, and Bob Percival, I just want to make sure we get this. Uh, John Barlow wants you to know um, that he's deeply appreciative for your ongoing contributions to our profession, Lawrence. And he writes, I have so enjoyed reading uh, your work over the many years since my graduation in 1981. Plus, you were one of the kindest, most approachable faculty members while I was at SLS. Okay, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> This, this may be kind of an inside the beltway question because I live in Washington, D.C., but your book was published before the revelations about newly elected Congressman George Santos. <laughs> Isn't he, you know, a powerful affirmation of your thesis, someone who completely, you know, invented his own resume, turns out to be a complete fraud, but now he's arguing that even though the local political leaders of his own party have asked him to resign, voters voted for this false image and therefore I have a right to serve them. Of course, you know, the answer that people give is that they didn't, they voted for someone who doesn't exist. But, I, but your question, I mean, it's a good question because aren't we always voting for people who don't really exist? They may not be, <laughs> they, you know, He's the most blatant form of it. But it's, you know, the public projection. I mean, this is another aspect of the, of the celebrity society. I mean, 
in, I think this is mentioned in the book, but who, who can remember such things? But the, you know, we talk about charisma. One of the reasons many of us think why Biden is not more popular is that he's a terrible speaker and he hasn't got any flash to him. And this is, again, something which is modern mass media and so on, because do we know anything about uh, whether Abraham Lincoln was a, quotes, good speaker? Thomas Jefferson? Maybe they had a squeaky voice or something. Maybe, maybe they stuttered, but it, it didn't matter because projection of this kind of image wasn't part of it. Now, but they, they, there was other kinds of fakery, of course. So it's true that this has always been the case, and he's an extreme example, but, you know, he's an example of something which I think is general, general. And it's been, you know, the people who write biographies of Reagan say that there was no real, nobody really ever knew him. I mean, he, he was a trained actor and he projected an image that people loved, but was there, what was the real, was there a real Ronald Reagan? And so on. So that's a very good question. I hope they kick him out of Congress, but they <laughs> won't. <laughs> uh, I see Hank really. Hank? So I have a question that has nothing to do with this book necessarily and is deeply unfair and that I'm pretty sure you're going to duck. I'm going to what? Duck. I'm going to, okay, so why Since bother? Since you've proven yourself so good at doing that. But I bet a lot of people in this audience would be interested in hearing the answer, if you'll deign to give us one. Apart from the Frank May series, mm -hmm. and apart from books you've co-authored, do you have a favorite book that you've written? One or more favorites among your 178 published books? See, okay, so I'm gonna exclude from the competition um, The Roots of Justice with Robert V. Percival and- And the Grossman books, And yes. the two books with, and the, the books written and edited with Rogelio. That removes a, quite a few. <laughs> And Manuel is co-editor. So, so we're down to about 94. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, well, I, you know, I say I like them all, but that's not really true. Uh, the first book I published was called Contract Law in America. Its title is wrong. And <clears throat> the quid pro, quid pro press, which I grateful for because they published the mysteries till they decided not to anymore, but um, <laughs> they brought out, they said, this, is, this book is unavailable, uh, now it's pretty old, so we're gonna, we're gonna bring it back with a new preface, but we're not gonna change it. And when I looked at it and read it over, I thought, how could I have written this? <laughs> I said, this is so badly written. <laughs> So I don't like that one. I eliminate that one. I, I think my favorite is maybe Guarding Life's Dark Secrets, a book that I'm sure nobody here has read. But I, I, I kind of like that one. I, of course, I haven't looked at it in a while. Maybe if I looked at it, I wouldn't like it. But yeah, I think that I really like that one. I'm amazed you, you answered the question. Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> we have time for another? If... Go ahead. I'm just curious for you all. Do you guys think that in these fabricated identities made from the internet and during the 1900s, they were all created with some semblance of the person's authentic self? or it was completely foreign to the person's like daytime identity um, compared to their nighttime, like for Jack what, what, Ripper and people like that. I mean, was, is that a question or you just? Well, I'm just curious on your own like, opinions on it. It's hard for me to answer because I spend so little, I'm not on Facebook and any of these things. Um, 
But, but it is fascinating that people get so involved on it that they're, um, I guess Facebook is no longer in, right? It's something else. It's okay, it's okay. TikTok or TalkTick or whatever. It's huge in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. But, you know, I'm fascinated by the fact that pe what people reveal, um, and this is not just a small number of people, they're, there are two phenomena here about revealing. There are the people who go on re reality TV or who appear, used to appear in Judge Judy's program and people that are spilling their dirty linen in public. And um, I remember, I wish I had kept the source. There was a, uh, this, this happened actually, in, I think it was in Germany in which the gimmick was that they had various couples. Honestly, this is the true, this is a true story, although it's not for the young, I mean the really young. <laughs> uh, and what they did is they had the boyfriends line up and behind a screen and all you could see were their genitals and could the women <laughs> pick out their boyfriend and I thought, <laughs> Do these people have mothers? <laughs> <laughs> so, as a, well, there are those people who, you know, I mean, I assume most people asked to be on this show would have just said no, right? <laughs> but some people did. <laughs> I can't remember how accurate they were. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there, though, this is a small group, but there's a very large group that wanted to watch it. <laughs> and, and I don't know, that doesn't answer your question. Maybe I never <laughs> understood your question. But the point is that the attitudes toward privacy, toward identity, toward spilling your dirty linen or washing dirty linen in public, are, yes, it's very complicated. I don't understand it really. I'm leaving it to people like Samantha to explicate because I'm just more comfortable in the Victorian period, <laughs> which is very complicated, much more complicated than people think. Even the, you know, the sexual code and so on is just really confusing and, and depends on levels of society and so on. But it's still, I think it's old enough that we can get more of a handle on it. I think getting a handle on what's happening right now is I, I just can't do it. I think it's too complicated. But you will. <laughs> I leave it up to you. Well, thank you. This so, a great um, talk. Bef before we um, thank all our, our panelists, I do want to be sure to thank our Stanford programs group who did a ton of work putting this together. I see Maria O'Neill. I hope Giselle is somewhere listening, but okay, thank you, Giselle, in the air. We're, we're super grateful to, to you guys. And, um, last but not least, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists and, of course, our wonderful beloved Lawrence. <laughs> Can't make it to